welcome back to my channel. Today's video is a preparation for hire video. I've chosen five topics that I think will give you a really confident start to hire if you revise them now and really understand them. The five topics we're going to look at are atomic structure and bonding, mole calculations, redox chemistry, systematic organic chemistry and energy from fuels. The structure of this video will be of questions for you to try and then I will go over the answers. This is a really good way of revising. This helps you to know what areas you really don't understand and what areas you're able to do. Don't worry if you can't answer any areas, I will go over the answers to the questions, but make sure you write down a note of which areas you're struggling with so that you can revise those before you start your higher course. Let's start with atomic structure and bonding. Pause the video now and label this diagram. Identify the element and then draw a diagram showing the electron arrangement for sulphur. Within an atom, we have protons and neutrons. Protons are positive and neutrons have no charge and together they make up the nucleus of the atom. We also have electrons, which are in energy shells, and they are negatively charged. This atom has seven protons. This is the atomic number. If you look up atomic number seven on the periodic table, you'll find that this atom is nitrogen. Sulphur has an electron arrangement of 286. To draw this out, we place sulphur in the centre and then we have the first shell, which has two electrons. We can then add in the second shell, which has eight electrons, and then the third shell, which has six. Remember that electrons fill as four single electrons before pairing up. Pause the video and label this periodic table showing metals, non-metals, alkali metals, transition metals, halogens and noble gases. There is a step line in the periodic table here which separates the metals on the left from the non-metals on the right. There are four areas of the periodic table you're expected to know. Group 1 are the alkali metals. The section in the centre of the periodic table is known as the transition metals. The halogens are group 7 and the noble gases are group 8. Pause the video now and explain how ionic bonds form. Define a covalent bond and complete the properties table. Outer electrons are transferred from metals to non-metals. This creates a positive metal ion and a negative non-metal ion. The electrostatic attraction between them is an ionic bond. A covalent bond is the electrostatic attraction for a shared pair of electrons between two nuclei. Ionic compounds have very high melting and boiling points. This is because there are a lot of ionic bonds which need to be broken to melt or boil as a compound. Ionic compounds tend to be soluble in water and conduct electricity when they are liquid or aqueous. This is because the ions are free to move and carry charge. Covalent molecules have low melting and boiling points, as it is the attractions between the molecules that need to be overcome to melt or boil a substance. They tend to be insoluble in water and they do not conduct electricity. Covalent networks have very high melting and boiling points. Each covalent bond needs to be broken between all of the atoms to melt or boil the substance. They are insoluble in water and they do not conduct except graphite. Pause the video now and try these simple mole calculations. Calculate the moles of sodium hydroxide required to make 250 mL of a 0.5 mole per litre solution. For this calculation we are going to do moles equals concentration times volume. Concentration is 0.5 and you need to remember to turn the volume into litres. 0.25 before carrying out the calculation. This gives an answer of 0 0.125 moles. Calculate the moles present in 45 grams of sodium chloride. For this calculation we have mass and we require gram formula mass. To get the gram formula mass of sodium chloride we need the formula which is NaCl. Sodium has a relative atomic mass of 23 and chlorine has a relative atomic mass of 35.5. This gives a gram formula mass of 58.5.
We take the mass from the question, 45, and divide by the gram formula mass, 58.5, to give a number of moles of sodium chloride as 0 0.77. Calculate the mass of carbon dioxide produced when 50 grams of butanol is burned completely in oxygen. To be able to work out the mass of carbon dioxide, we need to know how many moles of carbon dioxide are produced. We've only been given information about butanol, so this is where we will start. We need to find the number of moles of butanol. We take the mass and we divide by the gram formula mass. The gram formula mass of butanol can be found from the formula given in the question. If we take the 50 grams from the question and divide by the gram formula mass, which is 74, we find that 0 0.68 moles of butanol was used. One mole of butanol will produce four moles of carbon dioxide according to the equation. We don't have a full mole of butanol, we have 0 0.68. To find the number of moles of carbon dioxide, we need to multiply this by four to get 2.7 moles of carbon dioxide. We can now find the mass of carbon dioxide by taking the moles and multiplying by the gram formula mass. The moles are 2.7 and the gram formula mass is 44. This gives 119 grams of carbon dioxide produced. Calculate the percentage by mass of iron in iron 3 chloride. The equation we use to calculate percentage by mass is the mass of the element divided by the gram formula mass of the compound. We need to find the gram formula mass, which means we need to have the formula. We have iron 3 chloride, so if we use the crossover method, iron has a valency of 3 and oxygen has a valency of 2. If we cross those over, we get Fe2O3. We can then calculate the gram formula mass to be 160. The percentage mass is the total mass of iron, which is 112, divided by the total mass of the compound, 160, times 100. This gives a percentage mass of iron of 70%. Pause the video now and try this titration calculation. The first step in any titration calculation is to find the average titer. To do this, we're looking for the concordant values. That is those that are within 0.2 of each other. So here we have 20.8 and 20.9. This gives a concordant titer of 20.85. We need this to be in litres, so we're going to divide by 1,000. That is the volume of sulfuric acid that was used. This allows us to calculate the moles of sulfuric acid using concentration times volume. The concentration can be found here in the diagram as 1, and the volume we have just calculated as the average titer. This gives us 0 0.0. 2085 moles of sulfuric acid. Using the balanced equation, we can find the mole ratio. One mole of sulfuric acid would require two moles of sodium hydroxide. We don't have a full mole of sulfuric acid. We only have 0 0.02085. We need to multiply this by two to get 0 0.0417 moles of sodium hydroxide. This number of moles of sodium hydroxide was present within the 20 mls that has been measured out. Therefore, we can work out the concentration by taking moles divided by volume. We have 0 0.0417 divided by 0 0.02, remembering to turn the 20 mls into litres. This gives a concentration of 2.1 moles per litre. Pause the video and try these questions on redox chemistry. Reduction is the gain of electrons.
oxidation is the loss of electrons. Remember, we can remember these together as oil rig. Write the ion electron equation for the reduction of lithium ions. You can find this on page 10 of your databook. Write the ion electron equation for the oxidation of chloride ions. Again, you can find this on page 10 of your databook. Combine these equations to form a redox equation. To be able to combine the equations, we need to have the same number of electrons in each equation. This means that for this first example, we need to multiply the silver equation by 2, and we can leave the magnesium equation as it is. This will give us two silver ions plus two electrons to form two silver atoms. We then have one magnesium ion and one magnesium atom plus two electrons. We can then combine all of this together. So we have two silver ions plus two electrons plus one magnesium atom to give us two silver atoms plus one magnesium ion and two electrons. The electrons can then cancel and we can rewrite the equation. The final check is to make sure the charge on each side is equal. We have 2 plus on the left and 2 plus on the right. To be able to do this next example, we need to take the common factor between the two. This means we have to multiply the first equation by 2 and the second equation by 3, so that both of them will have 6 electrons. So we'll have 2 iron 3 plus ions plus 6 electrons of two iron atoms, so three calcium atoms to give three calcium ions and six electrons. We can then combine the two equations together This allows us to then cancel the electrons and the equation can be rewritten without them. We have two Fe3 plus ions plus three calcium atoms, two iron atoms plus three calcium ions. Again we can check for charge, we have two times three plus which is six plus on the left and three times two plus which is six plus on the right, so they balance out. Pause the video now and try and name the functional groups for these homologous series. So alkanes have a carbon to carbon single bond. The alkenes have a carbon to carbon double bond. Alcohols contain the OH group, which is the hydroxyl group. Carboxylic acids contain a C double bond OOH, which is a carboxyl group. And cycloalkanes have a ring of carbons. Pause the video now and try and name these five compounds. In this first compound, our longest chain is the four through the middle. We then need to number from the end closest to one of the branches. And we can then identify that we have two of the same branch. Our branches are on numbers two and three. There are two of them and they're the same, so we're going to have dimethyl because they contain one carbon each and they are attached to four carbon chain, which is butane. For this next example, we have a chain of five carbons and we need to number from the end closest to the functional group, which is the double bond in this case. So the start of the name is going to be pent as we have five carbons. We then need to put in the number of where the double bond is. So the double bond starts on number two and then we end the name with "-ene", to show that we've got a double bond. For this example, we have the longest chain here of five carbons. We need to number from the end closest to the double bond, which is from the right-hand side in this case. We can then look at any branches. So we have two branches that are the same, so they're both methyl branches. 
The methyl branches are on two and four. We have two of them, so we need to use the prefix di. They've both got one carbon, so they're a methyl. They're attached to a five carbon chain, which is pent. And the double bond starts on number two. So we put the two in here, followed by the prefix, the followed by the suffix in to show that we've got a double bond. For this example here, we have a ring of five carbons. Because we have a ring, we use the prefix cyclo. There's no double bonds, so then it's just cyclopentane. For this last example, we have three carbons. We need to number from the end closest to the functional group, which is the OH here for the alcohol. There are three carbons in the chain, so this is going to be based on propane. On the first carbon, we have the functional group, which is the alcohol, so the end of the name is all. Pause the video now and draw a label diagram to show how you would measure the energy released when using ethanol as a fuel. When doing this experiment, you would have a copper can with a known volume of water, such as 100 mils. You would use a thermometer to take the temperature of the water at the start and the end. And you would place this within a draft shield. This will help to stop the heat escaping. You would then have a spirit burner that you would place underneath. And this would contain your ethanol. And you may also use some sort of timer to time the experiment. Pause the video now and calculate the energy released by this butanol. The equation that we use for energy from fuels is E equals Cm delta T. C is a constant that you find in the databook and is 4.18. M is the mass of water, which in this case is 250 mils divided by 1000 to get that into kilograms, which is 0.25 kilograms. And delta T is the temperature at the end minus the temperature at the start. So for this one, it's 24. So we have 4.18 multiplied by 0.25 multiplied by 24 which gives 25.08 kilojoules of energy released by butanol. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that you found it helpful and hopefully you've managed to identify some areas that you need to work on before starting your higher course. Remember to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new videos throughout the year. You can also follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Chem for updates and Instagram Miss Adams Chemistry for flashcards throughout the year. Bye for now.